All right, so we are going to get into chapter two, which is administration of intravenous products. And in this chapter, we will be going over the objectives that you will be learning, which include Are you guys still there? Yes. Yes. I don't know what's happening to my screen right now. Hold on. Can you see me change the, the slides? Yes, we're yes. changing. Okay. You got it. OK, so. So today we're going to begin learning about Chapter 2, which is administration of intravenous products. In this presentation, you should be able to identify the types of parental nutri nutrition and medications and name at least three situations where it would be beneficial to use a parental dose form. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to describe two types of intravenous administration. You should know that the abbreviation for intravenous is IV. You should also be able to give an example of each type of the two intravenous administrations. You should be able to name two advantages and two disadvantages of administering IV medications. And you should also be able to discuss um, the types of parental medications and supplies uh, used in both health system IV administration as well as home infusion therapy and be able to explain the technician's integral role in preventing medication errors when considering administration of parental medications. So now that we've gone over the objectives for chapter two, we are next going to get into an introduction of the intravenous products. So with the intravenous products, it's important to note parenteral medications are medications that's going to be provided uh, through injection. <laughs> the introduction that I want to share with you is that pharmacy technicians must have a good understanding of administration routes for parenteral medications. And in this presentation, I'll be going over the different types of parenteral routes. So with medications that are given parenterally, those drugs are going to be available in limited forms, and there are some drugs that can only be administered one way. So again, when we refer to parenteral medications, we're referring to medications that can be injected. So one of the medications that can be injected is an intravenous administration that is better known as an IV. Now the IV works by bypassing the digestive process. So the digestive process would have to do with the GI tract, GI standing for the gastrointestinal. Uh, the IV administration also reaches into the bloodstream almost immediately. So that's also why it's important that when preparing IV medications as a pharmacy technician, preparing CSPs, compounded sterile preparations, it's always important that we practice a septic technique and medication error prevention. That way, any medicine that is entering into the patient is not going to be harmful or contaminated. Now, a person may need an IV administration to replace uh, fluids. Uh, an example would be if a person needed 
if a person was dehydrated and they might need an IV fluid, so an IV might be used to replace their fluid. Also, an IV administration is another dosage form um, as an example. Now, pictured here, you see an example of how a IV might be administered, which is going to go directly into the vein. So fluids and medicines can be administered through a catheter, which can go into the vein. And pictured here, you see an example of that. So now that I've given an example of an IV administration, we'll next talk, we'll next continue learning about how it goes through. So the IV administration goes directly into the bloodstream through the veins and it's the most common parenteral route. It also has rapid effects, meaning that it works fast. And there are two different lines of the IV. Need to know, you have a peripheral line and you have a central line. Now the central line goes through an extremity, whereas the peripheral line uh, is going to go directly through. So those are the two common types of IV administration. So now that we've gone over the IV administration, we're next going to get into a closer look and understanding what the peripheral veins are. So peripheral veins are smaller. They also allow for the medication to be injected easier, and it's also the most common method of administration. So the peripheral veins, an example, might go through the hand, whereas the central line, which we'll learn about next, the central line is going to go uh, through the extremities. Now, a central line might be used if the person is weak or if the person has weak peripheral veins. So a central line might be used and you'll see where that central line is used. In the upper part of the person's extremity uh, where you see it pictured, where you see the jugular vein, the right subclavian vein, you see where the catheter might take place, and then you also see the internal jugular vein. So now the we've gone through examples of the peripheral line and the central line. We're next going to learn about other ways a medicine can be injected. So we've learned about the intravenous route. Next, we're going to learn about the intramuscular injections. Now the intramuscular is abbreviated as IM and the intramuscular injection is going to be directly go into the muscle. You see here picture where the muscles are. It can be in the uh, in the arms. You also have muscles in your abdomen. You have muscles in your leg. You see the front and then you also see the back. So now that I've given an example of where intramuscular injections would be placed, we're next going to learn about the intracardiac medication. So intracardiac medications are commonly used in emergencies. They can be found on crash carts and they are used to quickly resuscitate a patient. So resuscitate a patient means uh, they need to revive them. So the intracardiac injection is going to be given into the heart muscle or it could be given in the ventricle in the ventricle at the time of an emergency only. So pictured here, you see an example of what that may look like. You may have even seen a medical show uh, or a television show where someone had to quickly use an intracardiac injection where they would inject something directly into the heart. And so that would be an example of how that medicine was injected. So now that I've given an example of the intracardiac medications, we're next going to learn about another route of injection, which is intradermal. The abbreviation for intradermal is ID, and the intradermal medications are injected into the capillary rich layers below the epidermis. The epidermis is um, the layer of the skin. So here pictured, you see an example of how an injection would be performed if it was going intradermal. So you see the dermis. Dermis mean is the medical word for skin. And then you also see where that needle would go into. And then you see also picture where the muscle is. And then you also see where the subcutaneous layer is. So we'll also learn next soon about the subcutaneous, which is under the skin. So 
Now that I've given an example of the intradermal route and how that medication would be injected, we're next going to learn about the intrathecal route. Now the intrathecal is going to go directly into a space that surrounds the spinal cord. Pictured here, you see where the injection would go and it has a targeted delivery of the drug that's going to go directly into uh, the spinal fluid. So intrathecal would go into a space that surrounds the spinal cord. Now the abbreviation for intrathecal is IT. Medical abbreviation, IT for intrathecal. So now that I've given an example of the intrathecal route, as you can see pictured here, we're next going to learn about other ways medications can be injected. So you have the intra-arterial injection, and this is where uh, medications such as anesthesia uh, might be given. Um, now they also have where they may have to insert dyes into a person, um, and that and those dyes can go into the artery for heart um, catheterization. Now, another way medication can be administered would be through subcutaneous. And pictured here, you see that the needle would be uh, pointed at a 45 degree angle. And you see it's going to go below the dermis, below the epidermis, and then it's going to go to the subcutaneous layer of the skin. So in the subcutaneous layer of the skin, the medicine is, is slowly absorbed. Um, so slowly absorbed medications, an example of that would be insulin. So when people inject insulin, those can also be injected in the, in the subcutaneous layer. So now that I've gone over examples of the subcutaneous layer, we're next going to learn about the bolus or also known as the IV push. So an IV push is going to be a direct injection. It's basically a small amount that's in a syringe that's going to be injected directly into a port or an existing IV line. I have pictured here an example of an IV push being put into the line of an IV of an IV administration set. So on that set, there's going to be a, a way of how medicine can be injected into there. And so the purpose of the IV push is that it could allow additional medication without another injection having to be made. So if a person already has one IV line going, an additional IV push can be put into the administration set so that an additional injection to the patient would not have to be made. So now that I've given an example and a picture of the IV push, we're next going to learn about epidural injections. So the epidural injection is the injection that's given in an epidural space. And so that's going to uh, be also in the back of the patient. And commonly uh, anesthesia for the epidural injection is given during labor. And so you have a picture here uh, that gives an example of what that process would look like. And so you see the needle and that would have actual um, at the beginning of the needle is when they can insert the medicine so it can go directly into the spine. And so I hope the pictures that I'm showing uh, create more of a visual so you understand the concept of it. So now that I've given examples of the epidural injections, we're next going to continue talking about the routes of administration. So with parenteral medications, we've gone over a few. We've talked about intravenous, intradermal, intrathecal, intramuscular, and subcutaneous. Now, the purpose of those routes of administration is determined by the drug effectiveness. Remember, any drug that is Inter intravenously is going to go directly into the bloodstream and it's going to bypass the digestive. So some medications are broken down by stomach acid, so they must be bypassed. So this is why a different, uh, this is why the parenteral route might be chosen. So continuing with talking about the routes of administration, a patient may be un unable to receive oral medications for various reasons. If they're unconscious, if they have an uh, extreme case of nausea and vomiting, which it should be known that 
the abbreviation, the medical abbreviation for nausea and vomiting is N and V. Another reason why a person might be unable to receive oral medications might be their inability to swallow. Uh, they might be uncooperative. Some people do not want to take anything by mouth. Um, they may have a blood loss where they may need immediate intervention, which might be required. Think of something, an example like a blood transfusion. They might be unable to absorb anything through their GI tract. It's important to understand that GI stands for gastrointestinal. And another reason why a person might might not be able to receive an oral medication is because they might be dehydrated. And because the uh, IV is the quickest onset of action, uh, it's going to be easier for them to get hydrated if they use an IV. So now that we've gone over the reasons why a person might uh, be given a medication uh, parentally, we're next going to learn about the IV infusion. So the IV infusion allows for medications to flow into the bloodstream over a long period of time. Uh, some examples may be a person who needs a blood transfusion or a person who might need a tr some treatment with the antibiotic. So I have pictured here an example of an IV bag, which also has a administration set along with it. So you see the IV bag, which holds the medicine or, you know, the fluids, and then you have a drip chamber, which is going to slowly progress. And then you have the actual line that's going to go into the patient and is going to have that IV go into the patient's bloodstream. So now that I've gone over the IV infusion, we'll next learn about uh, intravenous administrations, such as the large volume parenterals and the small volume par parenterals. So large volume parenterals, is anything over 250 milliliters and up. So you have a 500 milliliter bag and a 1000 milliliter bag. Uh, those are considered LVPs. Now, the large volume parenterals might last anywhere from two to 24 hours. So the large volume parenteral is given continuously or intermittently, and those are regulated with an infusion pump or it could be uh, with an electronic device. So you have some that are regulated uh, by the stand that the IV bag would sit on and then based on how much the prescriber may want to flow into the patient using the administration set, it could be controlled by the nursing staff in regards to how much the patient is to receive or there could be an electronic device which can be set um, to either stop after a certain time uh, once the IV has started. So I've given an example of the large volume parenteral. I next want to talk about the intermittent infusion. So those could be from a range of 25 to 250 milliliters, and those could last for 15 to 90 minutes at a specific interval. Those also can be given between continuous infusions. So there is a way for a person to be on one IV bag and they might be given an additional one um, or they might stop an IV bag and then give a, a certain infusion for a certain period of time until another IV bag is put on. Just giving that as an example. So now that we've gone over some of the intravenous administrations, we're next going to learn about the advantages and disadvantages of intravenous medications. So one of the advantages of intravenous medications is it has a rapid onset of action, meaning it's going to work fast. You also have some drugs that's destroyed by the stomach. So any drug that's taken by IV is going to bypass the, the GI system. You also have another advantage, which is going to be that treatment therapy can be given parentally. So instead of a person taking something by mouth, which can take anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes to even digest, them being given the intravenous medication 
through an injection is going to be more helpful in regards to it uh, working faster instead of taking 20 to 30 minutes to start the process. So now that we've talked about some of the advantages of intravenous medications, we'll next learn about some of the disadvantages that it may cause. One of the disadvantages of the intravenous medication is there is going there may be a risk of infection. The risk of infection could come from the needle entrance. And so this is why when medicine is being injected into patients, sterile aseptic technique and personal protective equipment, which that abbreviation is PPE, is always required. So gloves are used so that it can reduce the contamination. And then there is also uh, the training behind making sure when patients are being injected that it's being proper and also avoiding any risk. Uh, other disadvantages is um, inf infiltration and then plebitis. Just using that as an example as one of the disadvantages of intravenous medications. Some other disadvantages of intravenous medications would include parenteral medication error or interaction. Some medications might interact with one another. Also, the cost of it uh, could be a lot. And so now that I've gone over the advantages and the disadvantages of the intravenous medications, we'll next talk about the health system and the IV administration. So where are IVs given? Well, IVs can be given in various places. Those places could include hospitals, long-term care facilities, uh, uh, emergency transport, for example, if someone is in the ambulance and they need immediate attention, uh, that emergency transport might have an IV bag that can get started right away. Other places where an IV might be given might be hospice. Those are for patients who are approaching the end of life. And then other places where an IV might be given might be in a doctor's office. So now that I've gone over the various places where an IV can be given, let's talk about the different types of medications that are included in parenteral. So different types of medications could include hydration, infusion. Uh, the person can receive antibiotic therapy, nutritional therapy, pain management, and chemotherapy. So now that I've talked about the medications that are included, We'll next learn about the home infusion therapy. So with home infusion therapy, the pharmacy technician is responsible for maintaining the pump, also the IV medication and any other supplies that's required. So attention to detail is very important, making sure that PAR levels are always being looked at, making sure that all of the supplies that need to be stocked are stocked and ordered on a regular basis and the pharmacy technician can be responsible for those things. So as we continue to talk about home infusion therapy, we'll also learn that patients and families can also administer with the support of nursing. Uh, you also have the long-term care or the hospice and this is where the nurse administrators, um, once prepared by a technician or a pharmacist, they will use a septic technique to have the infusion pump being given to the patient. So it's the technician that also must consider the route of administration as well as the setting. And that can include them having uh, IVs that's either going to be continuously given to the patient or it might be intermediate or the patient might even have to receive an IV push. So the technician must always consider the route of administration in the setting which the IV is being given to the patient. Now, some complications to consider in regards to the IV will be plebitis, and plebitis is an inflammation of the vein, and that can cause some symptoms such as burning, redness, pain, and even stinging. Uh, now, an infection might occur if someone's not using proper aseptic technique or using the proper PPE, personal protective equipment, and an infection could arise. Now, it's important that the pharmacy technician is familiar with the drugs, and that's 
being familiar with the preparation, how the medication is being prepared, and also being familiar with the administration route. So this is actually going to conclude my uh, presentation on chapter two, which is the administration of intravenous products.